Hi guys, my name is Alex, and today we'll delve into the case of a girl who went to her church for the evening service, but never showed up. Her parents got worried and called the police. During the investigation, detectives were able to uncover some chilling facts that revealed the truth about what happened to her. Zoe Hastings was born on November 21, 1996, in Kansas. She was the oldest of five children, with three younger sisters and a brother. Zoe was always there to help her parents look after her siblings, ready to cancel any plans if her parents needed a hand. Her mom and dad were deeply religious, so the family spent a lot of time at church. At some point, they moved to Dallas, where Zoe enrolled in a high school with a focus on creativity and arts. She had a passion for drawing and also enjoyed participating in school theatrical performances. In her spare time, Zoe worked at an art studio in Dallas. She also worked as a lifeguard at a local pool on a summer break. After graduating from high school, Zoe had the opportunity to attend some of the top universities in the country. However, she chose to postpone her education and dedicate some time to her church. In October 2015, when Zoe was 18, she was getting ready to go on a mission trip for her church and was eagerly anticipating the journey. On Sunday, October 11th, she planned to attend the Sunday service where they would discuss some details of their upcoming trip. Zoe took the family minivan, promised her parents she'd be back for dinner, and left her house around 4.40 p.m. The church was only a few miles away, and the parents expected her to return around 6.30. However, as time passed, Zoe didn't come back for dinner, which was quite unusual. They sent her several messages, but there was no response. They also tried calling her, again, with no luck. After some time, they started calling her friends and family members, thinking Zoe might have visited someone after the service, but none of them had seen her that evening. Finally, her parents decided to call the church, and here, they encountered a rather unexpected turn of events. Zoe never showed up there. The parents became even more worried and decided to contact the police. Such behavior was extremely unusual for their daughter. She always told them where she was going and never disappeared without any explanation. They called 911, but for some reason, the officers didn't come to their house to take a missing person report. So the parents drove to the police station themselves, filed a report, and began searching for their daughter. They retraced the entire route from home to the church several times, but couldn't find any trace of Zoe. This went on almost all night, and as morning approached, her mother suddenly had an idea. She recalled that her daughter had an iPhone tracking app, which gave them access to her location. They discovered that her phone was just a few hundred yards from the church, near a small creek across the road from it. The parents immediately went to that spot. To their horror, they saw a lot of police cars, as well as an ambulance and emergency services. Approaching one of the officers, they explained they were searching for their daughter, and the officer informed them that there had been a car accident. A few hours ago, the police received a call from a person who was walking his dog. At one point, a man approached him, said that there had been a car accident near the creek, and a woman was injured. They both ran to the scene, where the witness found this woman in a pool of blood, and called 911. Police officers quickly identified the deceased. It was Zoe Hastings. But they immediately realized that she didn't die as a result of the accident. It was obvious from the first look that she had been a victim of murder. Zoe lay on the ground a few hundred yards from the minivan, which was partially submerged in the creek. There was a lot of blood near her body, and police officers noticed multiple cuts on her neck. Zoe's dress was pulled up, and her underwear was rolled down, leading detectives to assume that the killer likely assaulted her. Zoe's parents tried to approach their daughter, but the officers stopped them, saying they shouldn't witness such a gruesome scene. 
While investigating the crime scene, officers found several clues. All the minivan doors, except the drivers, were locked. This could indicate that the perpetrator either drove the vehicle themselves or approached Zoe directly at the scene. A few yards from the creek, near an embankment under the bridge, police found a blood-covered knife, which was likely used as the murder weapon. Zoe's smartphone helped investigators establish the timeline of events. GPS data revealed that she arrived at the creek at 5.01 p.m., just 20 minutes after leaving home, and apparently she was killed within minutes from that moment. Police also found out that after leaving home, Zoe made one stop. She went to a DVD rental service near her local Walgreens to return a movie. While experts examined the victim's body and all the available evidence, detectives decided to look for potential witnesses who were at the store or nearby at the same time as Zoe. After speaking with dozens of people, they managed to find two potential witnesses. The first was Lester Clark, who worked at a tattoo parlor next to the store. On that day, around 4.45 p.m., he went to buy cigarettes and saw a woman near the DVD rental service. Shortly after, Lester saw her returning to the parking lot and approaching a white minivan. She tried to open the door, but at that moment, a man approached her, stopped the door with his hand, and said something to her. After that, the woman got into the car and moved to the passenger seat. The man got into the driver's seat and they drove away. Detectives showed Lester a photo of Zoe, and he said that the woman did indeed resemble her. Despite finding the scene quite tense, he didn't think much of it, as nothing obviously bad seemed to happen. The witness also provided a description of the man. He was short, heavily built African-American. Lester was standing at a considerable distance from the parking lot, so he couldn't make out any other features. Later, as it was getting dark, he noticed the same man again, walking towards the store alone. The second witness was a homeless man named Gary Whitman, who shared a similar story. Around 4.45 p.m., when he was across the street from the parking lot, he saw a woman heading towards the white minivan. Suddenly, a man approached her from behind, preventing her from getting into the car. He then took something out of his pocket and showed it to the woman. After that, she got into the car, moved to the passenger seat, while the man got into the driver's seat and drove away. Gary provided a similar description of the suspect and added that the situation struck him as highly suspicious. He went into the store and asked the clerk to call 911. However, it's unclear if the clerk complied with his request as police found no records of this call. While investigators interviewed witnesses, experts made several discoveries. The forensic pathologist examined the victim's body and found traces of male semen but the amount was so small that conducting a full DNA analysis was simply impossible. This only confirmed that the perpetrator had sexually assaulted the victim before the murder. Investigators also examined the victim's car and couldn't find any foreign fingerprints on either the doors or the steering wheel. Based on witness statements, the suspect could have driven Zoe away from the store parking lot in her minivan, which caught the detectives off guard. However, they didn't rule out the possibility that the killer may have simply wiped down the steering wheel and door handle after the murder. Several hairs were also found on Zoe's body, but experts couldn't extract a full DNA sample from them as they were too small. But when they examined the knife found near the crime scene, they finally had a breakthrough. A DNA sample was discovered on it, which was immediately uploaded to the FBI database, and police got a match. The sample belonged to 34-year-old Antonio Cochran. The man had a lengthy criminal history dating back to his teenage years. He had been arrested for thefts, assaults, home invasions, and was also suspected of numerous other crimes. The year before these events, in 2014, a 17-year-old daughter of his girlfriend accused Antonio of sexual assault. According to her, he offered her a ride but once she was in the car, Antonio took her to a wooded area, threatening to kill her if she tried to escape. There, he assaulted her and the man was arrested. He claimed they had consensual sex 
and the case went to court. However, during the trial, the prosecution couldn't provide enough evidence to prove his guilt, so Antonio was found not guilty. With his DNA found on the knife, police identified Antonio as the prime suspect, and he was arrested. During the interrogation, he repeatedly denied any involvement in the murder, so the detectives focused their efforts on finding more evidence. The experts took a DNA sample from Antonio and tried to compare it with the hairs and semen found on the victim's body. Since both pieces of evidence were too small to extract a full sample, experts decided to try a different type of analysis. They were able to generate an approximate profile and determine if it definitely did not match the chosen DNA. In other words, this method operates on the principle of exclusion, but it does not yield any precise results and cannot be used as a proof of guilt. They compared these partial profiles from the hair and semen with the suspect's DNA and concluded that their similarity couldn't be excluded. Meanwhile, detectives examined Antonio's smartphone and found several interesting text messages. Putting them together, it became clear that on the day of the murder, he was in a very troubled state of mind. At 1.48 a.m., the day before Zoe's death, he texted a friend he lived with, saying he was moving out and he would never see him again. On the next day, at 2.07 p.m., he texted his ex-girlfriend, telling her that his stepmother died. He mentioned she died right in front of him and he was finding it difficult to cope with the loss. Over the next hour, Antonio texted another woman twice, stating he had been drinking all night, driving around the city, and crying. These were his final messages before Zoe's death. Later that evening, at 9.30 p.m., he texted his friend again, expressing confusion about what to do with his life and how things had recently taken a turn for the worse. The next day, he sent another message to his ex-girlfriend, saying, his life is over, and she would soon find out why. Examining his browser search history, detectives found that Antonio had visited local news websites over 30 times before his arrest, specifically checking the crime sections. Five of those visits were directly related to articles about Zoe's murder. They also noticed that, prior to her death, he hardly ever visited news sites. Police only found one page in his history related to a gang activity. Antonio's smartphone gave the detectives another lead. Experts obtained GPS data from his cell phone provider and discovered that at 4.34 p.m., his phone connected to a tower covering the area where the store was located. This coincided with the time Zoe was there, but this data wasn't considered strong evidence. It only indicated that his phone was within a few miles of the tower. Nevertheless, it suggested that Antonio arrived in the area just minutes before Zoe left the parking lot. His home was quite far, and throughout the day, his phone had been connected to a different nearby tower. Detectives also learned that Antonio had started a new job at a grocery store just three days before the incident. On Monday, the day after the murder, he didn't show up for his shift without giving any explanation. Despite the extensive list of circumstantial evidence against Antonio, the only strong evidence remained the suspect's DNA on the handle of the knife. However, this could have posed a problem as such evidence alone is often insufficient for a conviction because merely holding a knife doesn't prove the act of murder. For instance, he could have used the knife under different circumstances and someone else might have used it to commit the crime. But detectives couldn't find any other evidence, so they decided to proceed with the case and take it to court. The prosecution presented its version of what happened on that day. When Zoe returned to the parking lot to her car, Antonio approached her, pulled out a knife from his pocket, and threatened her to get in the car. He then took the driver's seat himself and drove away. Based on messages sent by the suspect before the murder, he was in a distressed emotional state due to the death of a relative and had consumed a significant amount of alcohol. According to the investigator's version, he decided to abduct the victim with the intention of assaulting her. He chose Zoe randomly because she happened to be in the parking lot at that moment, and Antonio simply saw an opportunity to commit the crime. 
The man drove her to a nearby creek, nestled in a low-lying area surrounded by trees, making it difficult to see it from any direction. There, he forced the victim out of the car, assaulted her, and inflicted six stab wounds to her neck area. He then got back into the car and attempted to drive it into the creek, possibly to conceal any remaining evidence in the vehicle. However, the car only partially submerged in the water, so Antonio could have wiped the steering wheel and door handle clean of his fingerprints and fled the scene. According to the testimony of the first witness, he saw a similar-looking man returning to the store's parking lot on foot that evening. The defense argued that the majority of the evidence could hardly be considered even circumstantial. For instance, the partial analysis of hair and semen only indicated that Antonio couldn't be excluded as the source of these samples, but didn't conclusively prove his involvement. Regarding the DNA on the knife, the defense seized upon the fact that this evidence alone didn't establish the fact of the murder. According to their version, Antonio could have come into contact with the knife under different circumstances. Before working at the store, he had a job at a movie theater, where he sometimes had to collect various items left behind by visitors, including knives. But no evidence was found to support this version. Moreover, if someone else had taken the knife from the theater and used it to commit the murder, they would have had to somehow avoid erasing Antonio's DNA from the handle, which would have been quite a challenging task. The defense also attempted to challenge the credibility of the second witness, the homeless man, Gary. It turned out that he had an active arrest warrant on his name for violating the conditions of his parole. The defense tried to use this fact to exclude his testimony from the case files, but the prosecution objected. In their view, the fact that a person with an active arrest warrant voluntarily came into contact with the police indicated that he genuinely wanted to help. Gary himself stated that he was just trying to do the right thing, knowing that he would be arrested because of it. Antonio's lawyers also tried to convince the jury that at the time of Zoe's murder, their client was elsewhere, helping a friend, but no substantial evidence supporting this version was presented. Initially, the prosecution sought the death penalty for Antonio, but during the trial, it became clear that with the available evidence, this would be highly problematic. Therefore, they abandoned these plans. After prolonged deliberation, the jurors eventually found Antonio guilty of murder. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Zoe's parents thanked the investigators and all the participants in the trial for achieving justice for their daughter. Her father also shared that from a young age, he had warned all his children about the dangers the world might pose to them. He had exerted all his efforts to protect them, but his eldest daughter was abducted just a few hundred yards from their home, and he couldn't do anything to prevent it. All right, guys, share your thoughts on this story in the comment section, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you for watching.